Today I want to share with you on the subject, a very important subject, the subject of the existing one. Also, I would, I would call it the um, fundamental Christianity, the existing one, fundamental Christianity. This is in Exodus chapter 3 is when, when God first had this encounter with, with uh, Moses and commissioned Moses to go to Pharaoh and, and to go to the children of Israel. And Moses is kind of not understanding how he's going to do this. And he said to, he said to God, uh, you know, what do, who do I tell him has sent me? In, in Gen- Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to go to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now, I, I've, I've shared this section of Scripture before here at the church. Obviously, uh, you know, we have this uh, beautiful tapestry that was made. Uh, Marat uh, Katenshi helped us to get this and uh, uh, says, Yahweh is our God. And I've covered this section of Scripture with you. And this morning, I'm going to do it again. And hopefully, there is more insight that you will gain as a result of it. So please don't don't let your mind say, I've heard this before, because um, you're going to hear it again, and hopefully it will have impact in a different way. And he said, uh, what is his name? What shall I say to them? In verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me. I am has sent me. The words I am... Is used, they're used three times in the, in the verse, right? I am who I am. Tell them, I am sent me. Those words are made up of one Hebrew word, haya, H-A-Y-A-H, which is, the, that particular word is translated over 1,300 times in the Old Testament. It's a common word, and it means, it's translated to be, become, come to pass, exist, to exist, existence, happen, and many other forms of very similar word. And here it's in the verb in the third person, masculine and singular, which I know you all are very aware of what that means. I'm being sarcastic. I know you have no idea what I just said. But uh, it could be he. Uh, if it's third person, masculine, singular, it would be he. And in the tense of the verb is the imperfect, so that... In Exodus 3.14, it would literally say, instead of I am, it would read, he exists. However, I am is a pretty good translation. Some translations, other than the one I'm reading, have it as he exists. I am is pretty good. I am who I am. It really isn't his name. He's explaining who he is. You see, the, the Egyptians are coming out of Egypt. In Egypt is polytheism. They got all these gods. They got the god of the sun, the moon. They got the god of the Nile River. They got the god of cattle. They got, and he said, look, I am who I am. I am the existing one. I am he who exists. Then the next verse goes on to say, verse 15, furthermore, said Moses, furthermore, fur, I'm sorry, verse 15, God further said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, have sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name. The words, the Lord, again up here on the slide, the words, the Lord, are from the Hebrew word. They don't have vowels. It's the Hebrew word, Y-H-W-H. It's pronounced by most of us Yahweh. We've heard it a number of times this morning. Or Yahweh, as some others pronounce it that way. And there's other, I've heard other pronunciations of it. It's from the word, that root word that we just talked about, I am, which is that word Hayai, Haya, the existing one. He, in other words, Yahweh, God's name, Yahweh, his name, what it means is the existing one. He is the existing one. He is here in this place right now. He is always with us in place and time. Verse 14 tells you who he is, the existing one. 
And verse 15 tells you his name, reminding us that he is always here in this place at this time. This is significant. The reason this is significant, it, there's many reasons, but the one I want to point out to you this morning is he is the only ex- eternal one. He is the only existing one. You know, it says in Revelation chapter 4 is a, is this a succinct summary of this where it says, Revelation 4.11 says, He was, He is, He is to come. That's another way of understanding God's name. God's name is Yahweh. Now, God has so many outstanding characteristics. He's loving, He's compassionate, He's merciful. I mean, He's the Creator. There are so many. He's all-powerful. And I can go on and on and on of the, of the attributes of the God that we love and worship. There are so many of them. The one that he chose to really emphasize and to highlight for all of us to always remember is he is the existing one. When you hear his name, which is, by the way, written over 7,000 times in the Old Testament alone. That's a lot of times. Over 7,000 times, the word, unfortunately, in the English Bible, they translated it the Lord. It really... And, and they didn't want to take the Lord's name in vain, so they, they wrote the Lord. It should be Yahweh. Yahweh. So every time you hear that name, every time you see that name, every time you think that name, what you should think is, He is with me right now. Wherever you are, no matter what happens, no matter where you go, He is with you right now. If there's a tragedy that's going on, He's there with you. If it's a good day, He's there with you. When you leave church this morning, you drive home, He is there with you. When you get home, He is there with you. This is so important for us to understand. It's pretty hard for me to ignore my wife continually. (laughs) Because she is with me in my home. Right? You know, when you're living with somebody, when you you acknowledge the person, God is with you all the time. This is, what, this is the foundation of Christianity, is understanding His ever-presence with you, so that you communicate with Him, you speak with Him, you thank Him, you praise Him, you, you, know, you ask for His involvement in your life. What should I do? Help me, guide me. That you have this ongoing conversation with the ever-present God that is, your, is with you, the existing one. He could have said, I want you to remember me constantly as the, the loving one, or the compassionate one, and so on. I, you know, he, he chose his own name, the existing one. And again, he is the only one that is the existing one. He, is, he has always been. He is now, and he will always be. The angels were created. Jesus was born. Everything else was either created, everything else was created. He has always been, and he is currently with us now. Oh God, how I could, how I could, I wish I could illustrate this point or or press this point to us. Because it really is what Christianity is supposed to be all about. It's not about coming to church on Sunday. It's about acknowledging that Almighty God is with you all the time. Praising Him, thanking Him, loving Him, acknowledging Him. Um, And then it goes on to say that this is my memorial name. In verse 15, this is my memorial name. A memorial, you know, when we talk about a, a memorial, we, we're talking about, actually, that particular word that's from the, the Hebrew is also translated elsewhere in the, in the Old Testament. Memory, remembrance, remember, renown, mention. When we talk about a memorial, we're talking usually about a structure that establishes, that's established for people to remember either somebody or something. We have Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. We have Lincoln Memorial we have in, in Washington, D.C. You have Mount Rushmore, where these presidents' faces are there, so that you will remember them. We have JFK uh, Air, Airport. We have Martin Luther King Jr. Highway. We have a lot of things named after him. I mean, how... Pro- <laughs> I was thinking about this this morning. I mean, how... Uh, his parents were really tuned in. I mean, they named their child Martin Luther after the great reformer 
And look what Martin Luther King did to reform. I mean, what, they were definitely tapped in. Martin Luther King. So all of these different things are memorials. God says, my name is a memorial. It's something that should ever be in your presence so that you will remember that I'm with you. You're never alone. I will never leave you alone. I will never forsake you. Do you think you could find the book of Jeremiah? If you started in the middle of your Bible in Psalms, you'd go to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. You go to Isaiah and then Jeremiah, Jeremiah 23. I love these verses in Psalms that I'm going to put up here for you to look at that, that tell us that we should sing praise to Yahweh, you his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. We should give praise to Yahweh and give thanks to his holy name. You, O Yahweh, abide forever and your name to all generations. Your name, O Yahweh, is everlasting. Your remembrance, O Yahweh, throughout all generations. It's really, truly tragic that it isn't understood more fully and that people don't acknowledge God's name. They think that God's name is God, where it literally is stated 7,000 times in the scriptures that it's Yahweh. The great Shema in Deuteronomy, the, the, uh, the, the core heart of, of uh, the Jewish faith in Deuteronomy 6 is, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. You should love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all of your might. Yahweh, that's the great Shema. That's, that should be always in our thinking always before our, our eyes, that our God is the existing one and that he is with us. In Jeremiah 23, in verse 23, it says, I, uh, verse 23, 23, am I a God who is near, declares Yahweh, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in a hiding place so I do not see him, declares Yahweh? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares Yahweh? <laughs> do I not fill the heavens and the earth? Am I not everywhere present? Look at Psalm 139. In that, in that uh, Deuteronomy verse that I just quoted to you, uh, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. It goes on and it says... You should teach this to your children and you should teach to your grandchildren so that they know who God is. It's clear to them so that they would just his very name should, in, should pull us into him and, and help us to ever be aware of his presence. What did I tell you, Psalm 139? Let's hope something's there that's good to read. It is. Verse 6. Um, that's not really what I want. By the way, I changed the program the way we're doing it. I, I put uh, so that you have some questions that as you could follow along in the teaching or you could bring it home and hopefully during the week you would work it and write in and fill in the blanks and uh, make it a little bit proactive for you. In uh, Psalm 139 and verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot obtain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my abode in Shalol, in the grave, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn and dwell on the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, your right hand will lay hold on me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, the light around me will be night. Have you ever felt that way, that the darkness is going to overwhelm you, that the light that is around you is as night? Well, even in the darkness, even the darkness is not dark to you, verse 12, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. 
You ever have this time in your life where you've been on your knees and you've been really in distress and you've cried out, God, where are you? I have. Really, the question at that time is not so much, God, where are you? Because the answer to that is right here, right now. Really, the question that should be asked is, where am I? Where's my head? How come I'm not acknowledging? We get, we get so tricked in thinking that, uh, you know, in trying to analyze why, why am I in this situation? Why do I have this calamity and the, or this horrific thing that I'm dealing with right now? Trying to figure that all out. Really, what we should be trying to do is to focus on the reality that God is here with you right now. And God's the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he'll provide. He'll be there for you. He's not deceived by darkness. You know, the darkness does not overcome him. Light, night is as bright as the day. Darkness is the same to him as light. You may be, de- you may be in darkness, but he is not. Acknowledge his presence in your life. Allow him into your heart. Look at Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew, we come to the New Testament. And Jesus gives us another perspective on the name of God. A great, great perspective. Additional. John and I were talking earlier about Psalm 46.11, how it's one of my favorite verses, which says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. This is a verse that has meant so much to me throughout the course of my life. I often just sit and meditate upon that. Be still and know I am God. When I get shook up and when I get upset, I forget that. You know, I I let the circumstances or the situation or the people or what's going on in my life become bigger to me than God. And I need to be still, slow the mind down, stop the racing thoughts, just be still and know that I am God. He is here with me right now. No matter what is going on, everything is going to be all right. The existing one, the eternal one, the almighty one is with me. Be still and know that I am God. Well, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, the very first teaching, I love talking about the Sermon on the Mount because it means so much to me. Oh, God, somebody dirtied my glasses. And um, the Sermon on the Mount is the very first teaching that Jesus gave, uh, or the very first recorded teaching. He probably gave other teachings, but this is the first one that's recorded in the Scriptures. And in here, in this, in this teaching, he quotes, he, he, he uses the word Father. And I have them in your notes. 17 times in these three chapters, he uses the word Father. That might be the same amount of times that God is referred to as Father in the whole Old Testament. It's not used a lot in the Old Testament. But in Jesus' very first teaching, he introduces Yahweh as Father. It's really extraordinary. And uh, it starts in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your, light, let your light shine before men in such a way that, you, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 45, verse 45. So that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In 6.1. Beware, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Well, before I get into that, I just each of those verses that we just read, it referred to God, our Heavenly Father. And you know the Lord's Prayer, which is recorded in 6-9, pray in this way, Our Father, which is in heaven. One of the, one of the uh, religion, religion sometimes can be a problem for us. Uh, and... Uh, one of the ramifications of a religious act was to eliminate God's name from being pronounced and being spoken of. They did this, the Israelites did this, they did it in the Jewish faith. They, they, to this day, we're going to have, we have a Hebrew uh, class here 
every Sunday and we have a woman from the local temple, I can guarantee you this, she will not say the word Yahweh. She will not say it because they, they won't pronounce the name of God. They, they're afraid of taking the Lord, they, what they say, the Lord's name in vain, violating the second commandment uh, of the ten. And, uh, but in the practical ramification of that is we, we, we eradicate what that God, we don't know his name. We don't even know his name. And more importantly, not only do we not know his name, we miss the significance of what his name means to us, that he is ever present with us all the time. Another, another ramification of religion that has, that has uh, been detrimental to us is right here in this teaching here. Which, Our Father, which art in heaven, people think of heaven as a place where they go or a place where God lives, someplace up there. You ask somebody, where is, where is heaven? They immediately go, they look to the... T- and we, we should know now, through Star Trek and Star Wars, that there is no place, per se... No, <laughs> I'm that it's not it's not a physical location somewhere out off of Earth. That's I mean, heaven is used that way. Indeed, it is. But when we're talking about our our father who is in heaven, it doesn't it's not a physical location. It's a spiritual reality. Again, John, we were talking about this yesterday. He was telling me that there's all these different dimensions. You know, we we live in a three dimensional world. Well, God is in another dimension. He's in another dimension. He's in a heavenly dimension or maybe a a spiritual dimension. Rather than thinking of heaven as being some location somewhere far away, is that is that he's our heavenly father. He's not our earthly father. He's our spiritual father. He's our father. And to make a comparison between your earthly father and almighty God is a major mistake. Most of us didn't have any fathers anywhere near worthy of that comparison. And even if you did have a father that was near that comparison, he falls way short to the goodness of our God and, you know, the greatness of our God. It's our father who is in that other realm, that there's a whole other realm that goes on besides the five senses realm. It's that spiritual realm. And uh, again, chapter 6, verse 1 Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed of them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Verse 6. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that you, so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues on the streets, corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you. They have their reward. Whatever that gets you, that's all you're going to get. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You know, I I thought of this verse uh, this morning um, at our pre-meeting. There's a section in John chapter 12, verse 43, which says, Well, in verse 42, it talks about the Pharisees. Some of them believed in Jesus. They couldn't help but to believe in him. He raised Lazarus from the dead. All these other things had happened. It says, nevertheless, many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, for they feared that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. I, you know... That approval of men, it's, and it's, it is a human thing. I mean, I, you can't get away from it. We, we develop this, I don't know how old you are, but apparently pretty young, when you start being concerned about how everybody else thinks of you. And you start trying to mold the image that other people have of you. So it becomes important to you how you look, how you speak, how you, are, how you interact with other people, because you want people to think well of you. You want people to, to like you. You want people to accept you, to value you. And yet, 
It really should be of no concern to us. You know, Sean, I, I was up in the, uh, before the meeting, I was up in the uh, children's room there, and there was two boys on top of the, the, uh, the playhouse there. Of course, you're not supposed to be on top of it. You're supposed to be in it, but that's all right. And, and uh, you know, one of them was Wesley, and I'm looking at the other, ca- the other kid, and I can't, I can't, I didn't recognize him. Then I realized it was Danny. He had my other grandson. He had his hair cut so that he looked so much different. But I, from what Ruth told me, he was kind of upset because he thought other people would think it was just funny. I mean, we're all like that. We're all concerned about how other people view us. Well, you know what? We shouldn't be. <laughs> we should be most concerned about how God views us. Other people come and go. God is always there with you, all the time. Everywhere you go, everything you do, he is there. When you go to sleep at night, he is there. When you wake up, he is there. And he didn't split when you were sleeping. He's there all the time. And, you know, and and the good deeds that we do, we do for the approval of other people. As long as when I'm done teaching here, some of you come up to me and say, that a boy, Vince, I'm going to feel good for the rest of the day. But if some of you come up to me afterwards and say, oh, I didn't like what you said. Oh, I'm going to feel miserable for the rest of the day. That's human. But that's not, you know, we mature past that. Where where our concern is pleasing God. What does God think? What you do in secret, he'll reward you for. You know, sometimes it's, I don't need, I don't need revelation from God to tell me to feed the poor. Because the scriptures tell me to do that. Right, I can read, that is revelation. I read the scriptures. The scriptures tell me I'm supposed to, to take care of people that are in need. How I'm, who and how, I don't know. I don't know, because sometimes giving to someone that doesn't have doesn't really help them. It helps them to stay that way that they continue not to have. So I, I don't really know who to give to when. But God does. So I ask him to help me to understand, to guide me as to what to do. I work with him. He's present with me. He's my partner in my doing his will to help other people. It's his will that I help other people, but I need his help in helping other people. Because sometimes when I try to help people on my own, I screw it up. Not sometimes. (laughs) Pretty much all the time. But God knows, so you ask him. And then it's between you and your father. It's done in secret. He tells you what to do, and you're not looking for the, the approval of, and the acceptance of other people. God is there, and you're pleasing to God. This is the relationship that you have with your father, and you, you experience God in this way, and you grow in your love relationship with him. It's just something that you and him know. And when you pray, you might pray in a, in a setting like this, but you don't sit down and, you know, like the very first time I told you, not too long ago, I, the very first time I prayed, I sat down. And I said, that was the last time I taught. I said to the guy next to me, how did I do? He said, I don't know. I wasn't thinking about you. I was thinking about me. You know, and, and um, you know, that I was all concerned about how I came across. That's the wrong thing, right? When I pray, I'm supposed to be concerned about one thing and one thing only. That's Almighty God, you know, because that's what my prayers are all about. Uh, Mimi and I have been married uh, 43 years, and we have, we're very private people. There's, there's things that we share with each other, obviously, that we wouldn't share with other people. There's things about our lives that, you know, we don't, we don't even talk to our children about. That's, it's just me and her. It's because of the closeness of our relationship, and it's kind of a, a, a guarding of that relationship. We keep things secret, not in the, not in the sense that we are secretive people in, in, in a negative way, but in a very, I think, godly way, private it's, it's, you know, between her and, and that's what God wants with you. He wants to have that kind of relationship with you. A very intimate, private, just you and him. So in, in, the, in the context of doing good deeds for other people or in praying, or really, in, you know, it's you and your father. You don't, you don't go around and say, you know, God told me to do this. God told me to do that. God had me do this. Do you see what I did with God? No, 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 no. That's, no, no, no. No, no. It's you and God. It's you and the Father. God Almighty is your Father. Yahweh is your Father. And this is what we talk about when we talk about Christianity and how it's supposed to be lived. The foundation of Christianity, acknowledging the existing one. In Psalm 16, I have it up here. Psalm 16, verse 11. You will make known to me the path of life in your presence. Are you, are you looking at this? Okay. Joe, are you awake? I mean, come on. 
No, that's all right. Uh, you will make known to me <laughs> the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. In your presence is the fullness of joy. Now, how ridiculous is this? That you should ever be sad because you are always in his presence. You know what the problem is? You forget. <laughs> He's right there with you all the time and you forget. In his presence is the fullness of God. Well, you know, the, big, the, the, the significant part is you will make known to me the path of life. Now, uh, John covered this at the men's advance. You know, when you get directions, there's different ways of getting directions. You can get, you know, I go to MapQuest and I get the whole thing laid out and I got the directions with me. And then I drive down the street and I'm trying to read and drive. Very unsafe. I don't like that woman telling me what to do with the, uh, on my phone. You know, the best way for me to get directions isn't being told where to go and how to get there. It's the best way for me to have directions is for Jim going with me, him knowing how to get there and telling me as we're driving. I do the best that way. And uh, I just did this the other night. I, you know, Matt was with me, a uh, fellow Matt was with me. He told me how to get there. He did so well that I said, well, look, on the way back, why don't you just drive? <laughs> so, uh, and that's kind of the relationship that we have with God. He doesn't show you the path of your life from the beginning. The day you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, he doesn't lay out every detail of your life for the rest of your life. It doesn't work that way. But he'll travel with you wherever you go all the time. It says, that, it says that, you know, that it's God in Christ in you. It's the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is God in Christ in you. So that wherever you go, he's there with you to guide you and to direct you. He will show you, the, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. Now, God is not pushy. He really isn't. If you don't ask for directions, you ain't going to get them. He, it just doesn't work. He's not like that, that, that woman on the thing there. Um, what does she say? Um, when you go the wrong way? Oh, recalculating, recalculating. Mm. <laughs> GPS, that's what it is, right? Yeah. Well, God doesn't do that. Oh, Vince, you screwed up. I'm recalculating. I'm recalculating. <laughs> you did it again. You did it again. You did it again. <laughs> That's not the way God works. I have to ask, God is with me. He's ever present with me. But if I want his instruction and his guidance in my life, I have to ask for it. And, and he'll, he'll provide it. He will make known to you the path of life. In his presence is the fullness of joy. In his right hand are pleasures ever forever. In his right hand are pleasures forever. That's why eternity is being in his presence forever. In his right hand are his pleasures forever. And this is available to us right now and throughout the day and the week, all the time, because he is the existing one. What else do I want to say to you? Oh, our lives are divided too often into the sacred and the secular, or the, you know, the, the spiritual and the secular. We, we inhabit two worlds, the spiritual and the natural. The spiritual, or the sacred acts are thought of to be prayer. They're thought of scripture reading, praising God, fellowshipping with other believers, coming to church and these type of things. The secular is just like everyone else in the world. The ordinary activities of life like eating, sleeping, working, cleaning the house, family. We often, are, we often do some of these other things that are required of us reluctantly and with somewhat of a misgivings that, you know, because we're doing these other things that we can't do the spiritual. You know, I got to go to work. I got to do this. I can't. I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to God in my life because I got to do all these other things. We divide our life into the spiritual and into the secular or the worldly. And really, that isn't the way it's supposed to be. Uh, because God is ever present with us. We can worship God all the time. 
It doesn't matter if you're at work or you're, you're cleaning the house or you're driving your car or whatever you're doing. God is there present with you. Speak to him. Thank him. Praise him. Ask him for his assistance. This is truly what Christianity is about. Again, this is one of those ways in which religion has, in its endeavor to help us, has ended up maybe somehow hurting us. Because what religion has done, it's gone, Christian religion today, it's gone back to the, the archaic way in which God, it's archaic now, but it wasn't then, how God loved the children of Israel and let them out of Israel. He gave them the tabernacle. He gave them holy days. He gave them holy food. He gave them holy washings. Because this is what they needed to... They didn't even know who he was. This is the way that he brought to their understanding his holiness. But today it's entirely different. We don't live pre-Jesus Christ. We live post-Jesus Christ. He's been raised from the dead. He's seated into, in the heavenlies. He sent forth the Holy Spirit. And the way we live today is entirely different. The Apostle Paul tells us we don't honor days today. There isn't, you can eat any food you want. I don't suggest you eat mushrooms, but you can eat any food you want. You know, because... Uh, uh, <laughs> personal prejudice, right? So that, that, you know, any food, if you bless it, it's holy, don't worry about it. But what we've done in religion now is we, what we've done is we've said, okay, this is a holy day. We have Easter, we have Christmas, we have, you know, uh, Good Friday, we have different days that we have made holy days. We have 40 days before Resurrection Sunday, they refer to as Lent. These are 40 days of making sacrifices. We've made places holy places. The church is a holy place. If you go to the most holy place, you've got to go to Jerusalem. You've got to go to Rome. You've got to go to these different holy places. We've made places and dates holy and sanctified, which is, you know, I, I, I appreciate why we would do that. But in the doing of that, we say that those other days, all those many, many other days, are not holy places or holy days. Or we, all those other places that we go are not holy places. Is this building more holy than the mall? Is this building more holy than your job? Is this building more holy than your home? That's all dependent upon you and where your head is. Because wherever you are, Almighty God is. And wherever you are, you can worship Him. You can sit here in this place and not worship Him. You can sit here and think, Oh my God, that guy is so good looking teaching up there. And your mind could be very... Or you could be thinking the other way too. God, that guy is ugly. But either way, you could be thinking anything you want while you're sitting here. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is holy. It's all about your personal secret life. With Almighty, with Yahweh, your heavenly Father, and so, so when you go to work, that can be a holy place. When you're at home, that can be a holy place. You see what I mean by by religions, religions efforts to help people to live holy. The the ramification of it is ring it gone back the other way and causes us to not acknowledge the ever presence of God. Look at Colossians two sort of sum all of this up here. In Colossians chapter 3. You remember when Jesus was at the well with that Samaritan woman? And um, extraordinary that he talked to her like he did. She said, you know, we worship here in this mountain. You guys from Israel worship in Jerusalem. She said, where is the best place to worship? And Jesus said, woman, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, well, I don't know what he said that way. I forget what he said exactly, but the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. For God is spirit, and this is the way that he wants to be worshipped. It, it, it indicated to me, and it through the you can read this in John 4, I suggest it, that he's saying to him, it's not a place, lady. It's not a place. It's not a building. It's not a mountain. It's not a place. You don't need to go to Mecca, or you don't need to go to Jerusalem. You don't need to go to Rome. You don't need to go to church. It's, you got the spirit of God alive. And not only is God ever in your presence, he's in you. He's in Christ and he's in you. We can worship and we should worship all the time. As Colossians, we never, I never did finish this the way I wanted to. And I was going to do that today and I'm not going to end up doing it either because we're going to run out of time. Through Colossians 3.16, let, let the word of Christ 
richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanksgiving in your heart. Verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. You know what this is saying? Do exactly what Jesus did when he walked the earth. Everything he did was as God wanted it done. Everything that he said was what God wanted said. Everything that he did, every work that he did, was the work that God wanted to do. How in the world are you going to ever be that way? He's there with you. Talk to him. God, what do you want me to do? What is your will in this situation? He's at work in the world. What is your will? What do you want me to do? Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving glory to God or thanks to God. Then it goes on in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. We read that, didn't we? Verse 23. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Whatever you do, do it heartily as for the Lord. 